This is the equilibrium constant for Lugol's solution. And we're going to be determining the Kc uh, for the equilibrium between iodine, iodide, and triiodide in water. So we're going to need a lot of data. So let's just do the procedure here. Okay, so we're using a 50 mil graduated cylinder. Add 15 mils of hexane and 30 mils of the iodine, uh, potassium iodide solution to a 50 mil Erlenmeyer flask. And that'll be labeled A. And then we have B here. I'll we'll do that in a bit. Okay, so um, I didn't label these because it's pretty easy to tell the difference between the hexane and the iodine and the potassium iodide. Definitely won't be mixing those up. All right, so we need 15 mils of hexane. goes in here. And then we need 30 mils of the iodine, potassium iodide solution. You should see this is a uh, hexane, so that's nonpolar, and this is a aqueous solution. So there is going to be a a uh, layer. Yeah, so you can see that. So put this over here. So we need to pour out a bit more of the iodine. Iodide, okay. and then I suspect I need some more hexane as well. So we did 15 mils of the hexane, 30 mils of the potassium or the uh, iodine, potassium iodide, and now we're going to do those 15 and 30, now we're going to do 30 and 15. And the reason is, we want to show that the equilibrium constant is uh, independent of our starting amounts. We just need to know what it is at equilibrium. So this is going to be 30 mils of the hexane, and as I said, you don't have to wash this out. A few drops of, of the solution that's left behind is not going to affect anything. Nothing that's that we're going to notice. Okay, that's 30 mils of the hexane. And I didn't check the lab procedure. You can see it's a little tinted because there's some of the iodine left in there, but again, so this is very concentrated iodine, so that's why it's showing up at all. No big deal. And So we have our two mixtures, A and B, and we're ready to go on to step three. So the next step, we're going to put in the stir bars into each. I'm going to slide those down the side. Probably wouldn't break the glass, but it would definitely cause some splashing because these volumes are pretty high. We're not going to be adding anything else to these. Uh, so it's fine that they're this high up on the, the flask. Oh, and also I'm wearing gloves because of the iodine mainly. The hexane's not good for you either, but the iodine definitely will stain. So that's why I have gloves today. So we got the stir bars in each of the samples. We have stoppers to keep anything from splashing while we're stirring it. And here's our stir plate. And I don't know if this is on yet or not, so I'll be careful. Put this here. And then, yeah. Let me just turn it on and you can see the stir bar is turning there. And what you want to do, you want to mix this up because we need to get um, the components that are in the hexane and in the water to mix up as much as they're, they're bound to. You know, that's it. We're going to determine how much that is, but we want to give it a good stirring. So you want to get this going until it's really moving along. And then, uh, but not so much of it splashing all over the place. So this is pretty good. Keep going. You see now it's getting a little wild. 
but not too bad. Let's see what happens if we. Oh, we're at full full bore there. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Maybe slightly wild, but that's going to give it a good stir. And this we're supposed to do um, uh, for five minutes, so I won't show you that whole thing. But I'm going to do this for A, and then I'm going to stir for B as well. So we'll just just to show you how the, the stir plate works. Let me turn it this way here so you can see. All it has is just this one setting. You can just turn this up as much as you want. There are some uh, hot plates that also have a stir setting, but uh, this one is all it does. It's just a stir plate. Okay, so we'll let that go for five minutes and I'll do the same thing for B and then we'll start from there. Here's sample A. After mixing, I brought it over to the window ledge so you can see the layers better. The top layer is hexane. It contains iodine and only iodine. And then the bottom layer is the aqueous layer and that contains iodine, iodide, and then triiodide. So, and that equilibrium between those three will be what we're studying, but we're going to need the hexane layer uh, for a little trick we do with the calculations. So we're going to be titrating both layers. Okay. So we're going to do two titrations of the hexane layer, and that's going to be H1 and H2, so we're going to prepare these samples. So we're going to use our original sample A to do that. So there's going to be H1 and H2 for for sample A, and then H1 and H2 for sample B. But, B. but we're not going to do that one right now. We're just going to work on sample A. And to save some time, I'm just going to show the preparation of H1. But H2 will be done the same exact way. And then for uh, sample B, uh, same thing. We'll be doing an H1 and H2. But I'm just going to show you the one. So we need to... So we're going to be drawing out three mils of, of this hexane here. And the layer is clear enough that I can see, or the, the, the difference between the layers is clear enough that I can see what I'm doing. I don't have to pour the layer into a test tube. I'm just going to take the three mils directly off of that, out of that layer on top. And you'll be able to tell, too, if you've made a mistake, because this is a nice purple color. If you go too deeply into the water, you'll start to see that brown or orange come in. If that's the case, if you see even a drop of that, you'll have to put the sample back in and try again. All right, so, oops. And I actually did, you can, I think you can see that, whoops. So what you do is just put that back in and so concerned trying to hit that mark after the bulb that I'm Right there, I made a little mistake. So I don't think I did it this time. You can see, and then I'm going to just put the transfer over here. This three mil uh, volumetric pipette, it's really small, really hard to deal with here. That's why it's, uh, but I got it. All right, so that's done. And then once we have the three mils of the iodine, we're gonna add in the five mils of HCl. And then the five mils of the Ki. The other, the sample that we used earlier was the iodine and uh, potassium iodide, but here it's just the potassium iodide. And then we're gonna add in four drops of the indicator, the starch indicator. And the four is just one, two, three, four. Just recommended if you accidentally put in an extra one or two, no big deal. So that's our first sample. I'm going to do the same thing for H2. And you might not be able to see it, but these two sample solutions I put in were aqueous. So this has a, uh, a double layer. So you want to make sure that uh, when we do the titration, what we're going to do is keep going until all the color is gone. So you want to make sure the color is gone from both layers. But we'll look at that when we do the titration. So here's our first sample. And I'll pre prepare the H2 sample for A. And then I'll do the H1 and H2 sample samples for B. So we'll have four hexane titrations to do. Okay. 
Now we're going to work on the water layer titrations and make the, the samples. So I'm going to take three mils of the water layer. So we're going to have to go below the hexane layer. I'm sure, we're going to. No. And, um, but then everything's the same. So we have the three mils of the water layer, then five mils of the HCl, five mils of the KI. So you can see them. And then four mil or four drops of the starch indicator. Okay, so I'm gonna get these out of the way. And I'm gonna do a water one and a water two for sample A, and then a water one and a water two for sample B. So we'll have four water uh, layer titrations to do as well. Or aqueous layer, I guess you could call it. Okay. So we have to take the sample and go right down to the bottom. What I normally do is I, I leave, I'll just show it here, I leave this a little open or a little up so that I'll push down on it and it'll force air through the pipette so that'll drive out any hexane that happens to get in there. You'll see there's going to be bubbling. And then I'm at the bottom and when I draw this up it should all be that orange, almost a golden color really. So, get the sample, whoa, went too far. And then into the water, into W1. So that's three mils of the water layer. And that contains the iodine, iodide, and triiodide, I3 minus in there. So all three of those components. Get this out of the way. And then we're going to add in the five mils of the HCl. And then the five mils of the Ki. And the concentrations are given in the lab. If you're wondering what these are, those are shown on the first page. So, and then I'm going to put in four drops. One, two, three. Okay, and where did I put the other samples? Okay, let me just bring one over here. Here's the the hexane. You can see that it has kind of a purple tint to it, and then uh, there's a a layer or two layers, and then here it's just aqueous because that's all that went in. There's no no hexane that went into this, but they both will be titrated until they uh, lose their color, and so they should look like water when it's done. So we have our samples. We have, um, I'm just showing these here, but you have H1 and H2 for sample A and sample B, and then we'll have uh, the W1 and W2 for a sample A and sample B. So a, a total of eight titrations that we're going to do. Now here's the entire burette setup. At the top is the burette funnel that we'll use to fill the burette. The burette is the glass column. And down, it goes down to the valve, and below that is the our first sample, our H1 sample. Now, if you've taken Chem 1170, you've done the titrations before, so you have a pretty good idea of what this is. We'll discuss it as we go along. But I'm going to focus, when I do the titrations, I'm going to focus at the flask. And when I'm done, I'll go and show you the number that we reached for the volume. Here's the starting volume of the sodium thiosulfate I've added to the burette. You can see it's a little bit above zero. I'm going to have to empty out probably like two drops or something to get it to there, but I'll do that. And that will, for each titration that we do, all eight of them, I'm going to start at zero for our initial volume. So for your report sheet where it says initial volume, you can just write 0, 0.00 mils. Since the equilibrium constant will change with temperature, it's always good to know where you start temperature wise. So here, oops, oh, that's great. There it is. So looks like a little bit above 19, maybe 19.1 uh, degrees Celsius. So this is the titration of the H1 run for sample A. And I'm going to show this one completely. And then I'm going to list the final volume of this run with the the second run for the H2 run for sample A. And they'll be listed there, and you'll so you'll be able to fill out the report 
sheet as it's listed. And then I'm going to do W1 and W2 for sample A, and you can write those values down. And then I'll do the other four titrations for sample B. So all of the stuff that we're going to do for the uh, uh, first R for sample A. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting in the solution. And what we want to do is keep going until all of the, the color is gone. Now it depends on... See, we've already gotten rid of all the color in the water layer, which was orange, because there wasn't that much in here. Um, that, the water that was in here came from the solutions we put in. It didn't come from the sample A. And you can see that pink color, that purple color, is due to the hexane layer. And so we got to keep going to get all of that to dissipate. And I think you can still see it. The solution's going in a few drops, a couple of drops a second. And this may be a little tricky to see. I can still see the solution. I'll stop for a moment. Yeah, just a very faint amount in there. I can tell you, it works a lot better in person. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. I don't think I can show it, but if you look straight across the, let me see. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a, when you look straight across, you can see the slight hint of the color left. So I'm going to keep going here. Just barely there. Yeah, just a couple more drops, and I think that should do it. Yeah, I think that's gone. Yeah, very hard to see. I haven't done this in a long time, so I had to get used to it again. But yeah, it's gone. And I'll show you the volume here. And then I'll list it for the volumes for H1 and H2. This is the titration of the water layer, or the aqueous layer, for sample A. And so we'll do this one on. This is the first run of it. And we'll start, just have it go in slowly here. Oh, I guess not slowly. <laughs> I put in quite a bit there. Okay, so we'll go slower. <laughs> I'm trying to go drop by drop here because it won't take very much. Come on. a little slow. There we go. All right. And just a little more. Doesn't take too long for the water layer. There's not a lot in there as far as the iodine and the iodide. Just barely see it there. Let me stop to see. Oh, tricky. But I think there's just a little hint left. Yeah, I think that's it. Good. Okay, so we'll do that. Uh, all right, so to save time, I'm going to show the volume for um, the water layer one and two for sample A. And then I'm going to show the H1 and H2, W1 and W2 results for sample B. So they'll just be shown right in order and you will write those down and then do the calculations.